Okay, so this week's Parshas Amor. Uh, Amor means to say, and it begins with the law of a Kohen, laws of Kohens, and they're not allow- allowed to come to contact with dead people, with the exception of seven close relatives, spouse, father, mother, sister, brother, uh, unmarried sister, that is, and son and daughter. Additionally, some other laws here that they are not allowed to cut their hair, make bald spots over dead people, and to make gashes in their skin. They have to be holy to Hashem, and they should not defile the name of Hashem because they are in the temple, and uh, they bring sacrifices, and they have to be holy. Verse 7 tells us who they're not allowed to marry. So it gives a list here, a, a harlot, a woman who has been desecrated, and a, and a divorcee. So the halacha is that a Kohen is not allowed to marry a divorcee. If he does marry a divorcee, so it's interesting, in the Torah, there's prohibitions of who you're allowed to marry. But in some instances, if someone tries to marry someone that they're not allowed to marry, the marriage is invalidated. But they're not married. They're not, the, the, the transaction, so to speak, doesn't is, isn't activated. Right. However, in other instances, even though there's a prohibited marriage, the marriage is still valid. It's valid in sin, but it's still valid. So if a Kohen marries a divorcee, that's not allowed, but they're still married. If they wanted to sever the marriage, they need to have a divorce. All the things that are capital punishment, uh, the prohibitions are capital punishment, marriage doesn't click. It doesn't happen. Whereas things that are of, of a lower prohibition, the marriage is valid, but it's valid in sin, then there will be a requirement to divorce. However, the resulting progeny, so if a, if a Kohen marries a divorcee, the resulting children are called achala, which means that they are Kohens, but they can't actually do any work in the temple. They're still in the family of a Kohen, but they can't do any work in the temple. They're as Jewish as everyone else. It's, they can marry whomever they want. There's no prohibition. They're not like a mom's there, um, but they're not, they're not, they don't have the status of a Kohen. I had an interesting episode uh, when I was in yeshiva in Israel. There was a, uh, a student who joined the yeshiva and was a Kohen. But was he a valid Kohen? That was the question. Uh, because one of the women that's not allowed to uh, marry a Kohen is a harlot, a zona. And the Talmud gives clear definitions of what a woman needs to do to become that status. The Talmud in Yvamus, I believe, gives six classifications of what makes her a halachic harlot. Uh, it's all forbidden sexual relationships of sorts. And uh, this young man, when he found out about this law, he had this really awkward conversation with his mom to figure out what kind of, what kind of past history uh, she had. And she confirmed that indeed, several times she committed acts that would render her a zona. So he was stuck. But the problem was, is that his mother's testimony was somewhat dubious. How do we know that she's telling the truth, right? Maybe she is, maybe she isn't. And the question is, is her testimony valid to invalidate her son? We know her son is the son of a Kohen. That we know. We want to change his status. We have to know for sure. So this question actually went uh, to the highest rabbinical voice in the world at the time, who spent a grand total of 30 seconds thinking about it, which is a huge deal, because it wasn't so clear. And he said, sorry, your mom is not believed, halakhically not believed. We're not saying she's lying, but halakhically, her words have no uh, validity, and she cannot disqualify you. We assume you're qualified until we know otherwise, and we don't know otherwise halakhically, and you are fine. Why is she not believed? Because there's a certain bar. If someone is to be believed, right, we have to assume that they are trustworthy, right? But when someone's own testimony renders them a sinner, then there's no way for us to believe them. If we believe them, then they're a sinner. We can't believe them. And if we don't believe them, we don't believe them. So this general principle is that when someone's testimony, if it's true, 
makes them unbelievable, we can't believe their testimony. Specifically, if they are believed, then they're not believed, so then we don't believe them regardless. Right? We have two options. Should we believe them or not? If we don't believe them, we don't believe them. If we do believe them, then through her testimony, she is unbelievable, so we don't believe her. Next, we learn about the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, which is the, the, the supreme Kohen. Uh, and he has even more restrictions that he is not allowed to come to contaminate himself for anyone, not his spouse, not his parents, not his siblings, not his children, nobody. As the verse in verse 12 says, he should not leave the sanctuary. The Talmud has, means when they're having the burial procession and the funeral, according to one opinion of the Talmud, he's not actually allowed to leave the facilities of the temple. He says actually stay there. According to others in the Talmud is that he's allowed to leave, but he's not allowed to leave his holy status. So he can't leave in a way, he can't participate in a way that renders him contaminated. So the Talmud says that what, what they would do is uh, he would walk uh, behind the procession in a way that he actually doesn't ever see the actual funeral. So if they make a left out of a boulevard, he could turn into the boulevard that they just left for. And uh, the pool of women that he's allowed to marry is even narrower. He's not allowed to marry, in addition to the three women that the regular Kohen is not allowed to marry, he's not allowed to marry also a widow and also a non-virgin. He has to marry a virgin woman. Uh, so even more restrictions for him. Next, the Torah tells us about which kind of Kohanim are allowed to participate. If someone is a a Kohen who is who has a certain physical blemish, then they are not allowed to work in the temple. It's not uh, appropriate that someone who is disfigured to work in the temple. So it gives a list of various uh, ailments that someone may have that would render him invalid so long as he has those blemishes to be in the temple. In addition, the halacha states that a Kohen has to do his, the work in his right hand. Whatever he does in the temple has to do with right, his right hand. So if he was a lefty, then he would have to work with his right hand because it was considered to be less dignified to do anything in your, with your left hand that would always do with, with the right hand. So even a lefty would be, would be forced to use his less uh, dominant hand. In verse, in chapter 22, verse 11, we learn about the truma. So truma was an interesting tithe. Uh, when someone was a farmer and you yielded a nice produce, you had to give, before anything, you have to give the truma to the kohen. You have to give a, a percentage of your crop to the kohen. The kohen, they were the public servant. They were the ones who were involved in in helping the nation flourish spiritually, and they got these special foods as a tax, so to speak, on the nation. Now, what's interesting about the truma is that the amount of the tax is up to the giver. Talmud says that if you have an entire storage house full of grain and you give one kernel, that's enough. You fulfilled your obligation. However, it would, the standard number was about 2%. So one out of every 50th, 2%. Some people who were very generous gave one 40th, and those that were less generous gave one 60th. But general, the average amount was one 50th, 2%. And this food, once it was given to the Kohen, and by the way, the Israelite can choose which Kohen he wants to give it to. Which is why that would encourage the Kohen to do to behave properly. Imagine if you could choose where your taxes go to. Uh, you, you decide where it goes to. Uh, so that's why uh, the Kohen would try to get a lot of friends because the friendlier he is, the more people he knows, the more people are likely to give him the truma. But once the truma is given to the Kohen, it can only be eaten by the Kohen. It gains a status of somewhat like a sacrifice, it's a heightened spiritual level, and therefore it's only consumable by the Kohen and his family. One more law here is a blemished animal. If someone wants to bring a sacrifice, the laws are that it has to be an unblemished animal. If there's various kinds of blemishings and it gives a whole list over here, uh, then it would not be 
valid. There's an historical episode uh, in which, in the Talmud tells, uh, where one of the uh, haters of the Jewish people, uh, he developed a scheme to try to lose the Jewish people's favor in the eyes of Rome. And he went to the Caesar and he told the Caesar, Jews don't really like you. Why? Because you'll bring a sacrifice to the temple. And we know the temple was the spiritual epicenter of the world. Even non-Jews were allowed to bring sacrifices. So you bring a, te- you bring a sacrifice to the uh, temple and they're not going to accept it. And that's obvious that they really hate you and want to rebel against you. He says, oh, okay, let, let's inspect. So he sent a sacrifice. And this messenger, he made a little cleft in the eye in the eyelid of, this, of the animal. Which, for the Romans, it was no big deal. They couldn't even tell. The animal's fine. But as one of the laws of the Torah, that would invalidate the animal. And the Jewish people, they got the animal. It's from, it's from Rome. And uh, they inspected the animal. This is from Caesar. And they know that there's a lot of uh, political uh, capital at stake. And they inspected it. And they found that it has a blemish. And they were faced with the dilemma. What do we do? Do we sacrifice it? and go against Torah law? Or do we be a little bit more lenient uh, and not lose favor in the eyes of Rome? So ultimately, they, the majority of people decided, let's sacrifice it anyhow. And then one old rabbi says, wait a minute, what? The Torah says no, and because Rome, and because we don't want them to hate us, we're going to we're going to compromise in Torah law? Absolutely not. And they ultimately rejected it, and that helped to the devolvement of the relationship that the Jews had with Rome. And the Talmud is very critical of that rabbi. They said, sometimes, yes, you'll, 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 you'll uh, transgress the Torah law, but if the Jewish nation is at stake and there's millions of people that, that are living under the uh, sword of Rome, maybe you could uh, transgress the law. Chapter 23 gives us a very detailed account of all the holidays. Uh, and this several times in the Torah, it appears. We already had it once in the book of Exodus. We're going to have it again in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. And every time it gives us a little different angle of the holidays. Uh, here, it really lists all of the holidays, including Shabbos, which I was trying to figure out why is Shabbos included in the holidays. But it goes through all of them. We'll go through them uh, one by one because there are some important lessons for us to draw, especially because we have an upcoming holiday in a couple of weeks, the holiday of Shavuos, and we're, we're exactly halfway between Pesach and Shavuos. So it begins, Hashem sp- speaks to Moshe to say over, tell the Jewish people, these are the holidays of Hashem, these are the festivals of Hashem, and it starts seven days, for six days you labor may be done, on the seventh day is a day of complete rest, a holy convocation. Don't do any work. It is a Shabbos for Hashem in all your dwelling places. So Rashi is trying to figure out. Everyone's trying to grapple with the question. We're talking about holidays, festivals, and suddenly we throw in Shabbos, which doesn't usually have the same status as a festival. So Rashi tells us cryptically that when it's equating Shabbos to the festivals, it's telling us, that whoever desecrates the festivals, it's as if they desecrated the Shabbos, and whoever fulfills the festivals, as if they fulfilled Shabbos. And everyone tries to give their explanations of what Rashi is trying to mean. But Rashi is saying that there is some sort of connection between the two. Fine. The Ramban tells us that there is an important distinction that needs to be, there's a, there's a law that we need to learn. All the way back when we were talking about the building of the tabernacle, it began the description of the instruction of building the tabernacle with a warning, an exhortation to observe Shabbos. And there the Talmud uh, understands is that even though it's a mitzvah to build the tabernacle, it doesn't override Shabbos. And therefore, you have to stop on Friday afternoon, put away the hammers and nails, and pick it up after Shabbos. Now, holidays, festivals, have different spiritual or different halachic requirements vis-a-vis the laws. So while milacha, work is prohibited, there's certain work that is permitted, namely to carry, normally on Shabbos, you know, like carry from one domain to another domain, unless there's an Eruv, which unites it as one domain, that will be allowed on the festivals, and cooking, 
You let it cook, provided that the fire that is already been ignited from beforehand. So if you have an etched in fire, you can put a pot in it and cook whatever you want on Pesach, for example. Says the Ramban, before we tell us the laws of prohibited work on the holidays and the festivals, it's important for us to say again the laws of Shabbos to tell us that the more lenient requirements of the festivals do not override the more strict requirements of the Shabbos. Thus, if you have Shabbos and Pesach that converge, it's Shabbos and Pesach, you are actually not allowed to cook uh, in the way you would be allowed to in a festival because Shabbos still supersedes. That's what he says. Important law to remember. The go to Vilna says something staggering. He says, when it says in the verse, for six days labor may be done, but the seventh day is Shabbat Shabbaton. It's the Shabbos of all Shabboses. That is not referring to six days of the week. Rather, it's referring to six days of festival that are enumerated in this section. If you read the section, you'll realize that it talks about the first day of Passover, the last day of Passover, one day of Shavuot, one day of Rosh Hashanah, one day of Sukkot, in the beginning of the last day of Sukkot, Shemini Yatzeret. There's six days of holidays, of festivals. And all those share a characteristic that you're allowed to do certain kinds of labor. However, on the seventh day, which is Yom Kippur, it's the Shabbos of all Shabbos. It's a a festival that's like Shabbos. You're not allowed to do those kinds of work. And if you actually notice, in the text of the prohibition of work in each one of the festivals, with the exception of Yom Kippur, it says, don't do meleches avoda, a burdensome work. But certain work would be allowed. However, on Yom Kippur, it says don't do malach any work whatsoever. So what it is essentially hinting at is that when we have six days every week, and then the spiritual epicenter of the week is Shabbos, that applies to an annual cycle as well. You have six holidays, six festivals of the year, but then there's one super uber festival, which is Yom Kippur, which really is the spiritual energy of the whole year. Very powerful idea. Indeed, when you learn about Yom Kippur, you see exactly why. So it begins with the laws of Pesach. It tells us the first month, which is the month of Nisan, uh, on the 14th day in the afternoon, you already start the, 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 the Pesach holiday. On the 15th day is actually the holiday itself, the, the festival. It's called Chag HaMatzos, the holiday of Matzos, the uh, eponymous holi- uh, mitzvah of Pesach is the Matzos, and we have to eat Matzos for, for seven days. And of course, we just celebrated the holiday of Pesach, and uh, Lord knows our family consumed a lot of Matzos. And speaking about Matzos, I think it's... Um, you know, it is the mitzvah of the holiday. And whenever we say that the holiday is the holiday of matzos, it does underscore the meaning behind the holiday. The meaning behind the holiday is matzos. So briefly, if you look at the Haggadah, you'll notice a contradiction in how matzos is portrayed. The beginning of the Haggadah begins with halach ma'anya. This is the bread of affliction that our forebearers ate in the land of Egypt. So when they were slaves in Egypt, they didn't have regular bread. They had matzah, kind of cheap bread. At the end of the Haggadah, when it lists the three mitzvahs of the day, Pesach, matzah, and Mara, why are we eating matzah? Because the Jewish people left Egypt in haste, and their bread didn't have time to rise, and then for the beginning, first couple of days of the exodus, when they escaped, what were they eating? The matzahs that they had baked when they were leaving. And they left so fast, that dough didn't have time to rise. So that seems to imply that the matzah is the food of freedom. It's the food they ate, they, they ate when they left. So which one is it? Is it the bread of the affliction, or is it the bread of 
a freedom. And then we eat it on Pesach. And it's the, the holiday is called the holiday of the Chad, the festival of matzos. I want to suggest that, indeed, matzah is the bread of slavery. Jewish people were slaves to Pharaoh. And that's what they ate. When they left, their status changed. They are no longer slaves of Pharaoh, but they're still slaves, slaves of God. When the Jewish people, and indeed there's many, many proofs to this uh, textually, when they left, yes, they left slavery of Pharaoh, but they maintained their status of slavery, just the object of their servitude changed. Earlier, it was Pharaoh, they were submitted to him, and the transformation that happened at the Exodus was just who their master is. And the holiday of Pesach is to celebrate our slavery, the good kind of slavery, the slavery where we're we're indebted, where we're in servitude to God, we're committed and subject to God. That's the best kind of slavery. And I have argued in the past that the objective of the hundreds of years of in slavery and servitude to Pharaoh was to condition the nation into becoming complete and absolute slaves. Once they were absolute slaves of Pharaoh, all you need to show is that Pharaoh himself is subject to a higher master. Ten plagues that show Pharaoh's total submission and being humbled before God. And now the Jewish people say, whoa, Pharaoh's not the, not the boss. God is. And they just they just transferred their relationship they had with Pharaoh to God. And then when they left, what were they eating? They eating the same matzos. And that is essentially what we believe that's the role of our nation. We're a kingdom where God's representatives in the world because we're the nation that accepted upon ourselves to represent him in this world. And we have a Torah. And what's the Torah? The Torah is the guidebook, the manual for servants of God. And that's why we don't ask, well, why do we do things that don't make any sense to us? We learned last week about the shotness. You mix wool and linen. No one gets hurt. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to us. And that's okay because if you are a servant of God who has total commitment to God, your objective is just to do what the master says, regardless of whether or not – sometimes you understand it, sometimes you don't. There's another master vying for control of us, and that's the Yetzirah. And indeed, the lesson of, of the Exodus didn't end there. Uh, the lesson of the Exodus continues where we have another master who is a, a modern-day pharaoh who actually – has control over us by default, that's the eight Sarah, the evil inclination. No, you you are you are a slave. The question is, is are you a slave to the foreign God, the eight Sarah, or are you a slave to God? That's the only question. And that's why we each in modern day, we also need our Exodus. And that's why the Exodus is still relevant to us today. We spend seven days eating matzah to remember that we are slaves, and the question is to whom? And the Talmud goes as far as to say that the Chametz, that's the eight Sarah. So when we disavow the chametz and embrace the matzah, we're rejecting one kind of master and hopefully embracing another. And we spend seven days ruminating upon that, uh, quite literally with the matzah. And the hope is, is that we take the lesson forward throughout the rest of the year. The second day of, of Passover is when we start the Omer. And the Omer is an offering that we bring on the second day of Passover. And it's sort of this bridge that we have from Pesach to, uh, to Shavuos. You know, today is the 26th day of the Omer. We count the Omer along the way. It's, it's connecting us from one holiday to the other. And the Ramban, he writes uh, in our Parsha that the days of the Omer, uh, they are like the intermediate days of Passover. We know Passover is bookended by a, ha- by a festival and a festival, and then the intermediate days, what's well, like a sub-festival. And says the Ramban that on a broader scale, you have the whole entire seven days of Passover and the days of Shavuos, and then the days of the Omer are like the intermediate days. So there's a commonality between the holiday, the, the festival of Pesach, and the festival of Shavuos. Now we know Shavuos is the time we got the Torah. Well, what's the Torah? We just described the Torah as the manual of the slave. So perhaps it makes a lot of sense that we achieved freedom from our erstwhile oppressive master and became 
got a new master in God over Passover. And now that is cemented along the process leading from Passover until Shavuos, the Omer. And at the Omer, we actually got the eternal guide to how to serve God with the Torah. And now we could actually take this going forward. And that's why there is an eternal connection between these two, uh, between these two festivals. Now we know read in verse 15, that we have to count every day from when we bring the Omer until we bring uh, the Shtei HaLechem, which is this, the offering of Shavuos. It's seven days of seven weeks. That's why when we count, like today we counted today's uh, the 26th day, which is three weeks and five days. And it goes on like that until 49 days and the 50th day is Shavuos. And it's an interesting thing that... Uh, you know, if you were in prison, right, you count down how many days you're leaving. And if you were excited, how, how many more days till pitchers and catchers, right, for baseball fans, right? You know, there's, 20, there's a 45 days till pitchers and catchers. How many days till opening day? So why are we counting up? We should be counting down in anticipation. That's a common question that we ask. And we know we count up day one, day two, day 26, eventually till day 49, day 50. So there's two answers, perhaps, uh, to to answer this. We know uh, that the theme of Jewish holidays is, or the model for Jewish holidays, is like a sphere. That whenever a major event happens on a given day that is embedded into a holiday for that day, that creates a certain spiritual station that we can revisit every year. It's like... It's, it's we're traveling through time. Time's not passing by us. So whenever we get to Pesach, in the spiritual world, we're actually in the same place that our ancestors were when they left Egypt. And therefore, whatever forces are at play on – or were at play on that day are actually in play today. For example, this, this is a striking example. Talmud says that a couple of days before Shavuos – person should not go to a bloodletting session. What's a bloodletting session? It was an ancient uh, medicinal practice. People would – too much blood is problematic. They go let some blood out. They, they, they donate blood, but they just throw it on the ground. They just – but, of course, right after someone gives blood, they're a little bit more susceptible because they have less blood. So as a Talmud, a couple of days before Shavuos, no one should give let blood. Why? Because it's very dangerous. Why? Because when the Jewish people were at the foot of Sinai, there were tremendous forces that were trying to stop this momentous event from happening, and the Jewish people were at danger then. That's what the Talmud says. The question is, if they were in danger, you know, 3,329 years ago, what does that have to do with me today? The answer is, is that no, there was a spiritual danger that was present then, and that is still present when we revisit that time in modern times, every year. And therefore, don't do things that are potentially dangerous during the, during those days. When the Jewish people left Egypt, they knew they were going to Sinai. But they did not know how long was it going to take. So therefore, what they do is start counting. How many days have we been out? We've been out for one day, for two days. And when they got to 50 days, they actually got to Sinai. So when we are counting, we're actually reliving the counting that our antecedents did 3,300, 29 years ago today, they were counting. It's been 26 days since we left, and we're not by Sinai yet. What do we do? That's what they did, and therefore we're reliving that. That's one of the answers. And I think another answer why we count up and not down is that we're building towards something. If we experience Pesach, right after Pesach, we're not quite ready for Shavuos. We need to build and improve and grow as people to be ready for Shavuos, to be ready to receive the Torah again. And therefore, it's a cumulative process where we start with one, we start with stage one, and hopefully we'll reach to stage 50 by the time we need to be there. For example, there's a uh, ubiquitous Jewish custom to study the 48 ways of the Mishnah in the chapters of the Fathers. There's 48 ways to get Torah. Every day of the 49 days of the Omer, they would study 
one day. And the last day they would recount. They would recap all, all 48 days on the last day. Because we want to prepare ourselves for Shavuos and it's, it's, it's building upon it. Okay, so now the verse here, it actually kind of merges from the Omer into, the, into Shavuos. And it says, at the end of the counting, you have Shavuos. So it's, it's, it's actually, it's interesting that it's the holiday of Shavuos. And this is, every time the Torah does discuss the holiday of Shavuos, it downplays what the holiday is about. It, it kind of, it augments the role of the Omer and the Shtei Alechem, the, the sacrifices, and it downplays the whole holiday. We know, you look at the prayer books, it says that Shavuos is the time to give the Torah. It is the anniversary of the Sinai experience. Yet nowhere in the Torah does it say it explicitly. It highlights all the other parts of the holiday and downplays this part. So that's an interesting question uh, that I addressed in a uh, talk that I gave last week. You can find it on my website, rabbiwobi.com. Very interesting about the Torah's perspective of Torah. So what's the Torah's self-perspective? Because the Torah was given to us on Shavuos, and the Torah is talking about that. So it's talking about something personal and intimate, and it's very interesting how it addresses itself. And I don't want to repeat that. So if you're interested, uh, listen to that. But let's accept the premise that Shavuos is, as we say in the prayers, it is the holiday of the festival of the time we got the Torah. Uh, there's an interesting question uh, that I want to address briefly. What happened at Sinai? Jewish people got the Torah. What did they get? Well, for sure, they didn't get the Torah scrolls till the end of Moshe's life. till the absolute end of the Torah, they didn't get the Torah scrolls. So what they actually got was Ten Commandments. But they also got an experience. Why is Shavuos labeled as the holiday of the giving of the Torah? We got ten mitzvos. There's still 603 to go. Perhaps you may suggest that we got, these are the beginning of when we got the mitzvot, but that's actually not technically true. Because beforehand we got mitzvot, we got mitzvot in Egypt, Abram got mitzvot, uh, Abram got the circumcision, and Jacob got mitzvot, and Isaac got mitzvot, and Mo- there's many mitzvot that came prior. And, and in Mara, right up when they left, right after the splitting of the sea, they went to a place called Mara, they got mitzvot there as well. So these aren't the first mitzvot, and it's not all the mitzvot. The question is why. So quite briefly, the Ten Commandments are a microcosm of all of Torah. In the ninth century, Rabbi Sa'ad Yagon wrote a, an essay in which he listed all 613 mitzvos in these ten categories of mitzvos. Uh, now, the first two of the Ten Commandments, which is believe in God and don't do idolatry, is actually an even more condensed version of all of Torah because every positive mitzvah is a fulfillment of God, of God's request. And every negative mitzvah is a rejection of God's request. It's, a, it's, it's an act of treason against God. And therefore, it is on some level akin to idolatry. And thus, the first two, which we actually got from God himself, actually contain all of Torah. Thirdly, the experience of Sinai is the engine behind Torah. Because what Sinai taught us is that Moshe is actually a verifiable prophet of Hashem. Because we tapped the phone call. We actually listened in to when Moshe and God were communicating. And we experienced the prophecy alongside him. And therefore, we know forever that Moshe is a verified prophet. That's when he gives us the 613 mitzvot. We know that it actually comes from God. There's other answers as well. But either way, it's an interesting question to think about why is Shavuos considered the holiday of the giving of the Torah when we only got a few mitzvot? The answer is that we got much more than just a few mitzvot. We got essentially everything. In the, in the middle of the description of Shavuos, we get a reminder of the responsibility of charity. So verse 22, because Shavuos is the time of harvest, we read, when you reap the harvest in your land, you should not remove completely the corners of your field. Uh, you should not gather the gleanings of your harvest for the poor and the proselyte you shall leave them. 
Last week we learned this mitzvah, that as a farmer, you're required by law to give certain parts of your produce, of your bounty to charity. The corner of the field, you leave it for the poor people. If you drop some things, you leave it for the poor people. The underdeveloped grapes, you leave them for the poor people. And somehow it's thrown right in the, the, the festivals. Like you have three festivals before it, three festivals after that, and right in the middle you have this mitzvah of charity. And the question is, why is it placed over there? So Rashi tells us, why does it throw this mitzvah right in the middle of the holidays, the festivals, to teach you? Whoever gives charity in their field... It's as if he built the temple and he brought sacrifices inside the temple. So these festivals all centralize in the their full observance in the temple. And someone who does this thing, which is placed right in the middle of it, he's kind of hitting to the core of what the festivals represent. And as if he rebuilt the temple and brought sacrifices. Very powerful idea that Rashi says. And I think in light of how we introduced the holiday of Pesach and Shavuos, it does make sense. Pesach is a time where we recognize the dominion of God and our role as being God's subjects who fulfill his will. Shavuos is the time we got the Torah. And indeed, the rest of the holidays, Rosh Hashanah, we recognize his dominion. Yom Kippur, we beg his forgiveness. Sukkot is very similar to Pesach, as we'll see in a little bit. The objective of all the festivals is to recognize that Hashem exists and is in total control. When someone gives charity, they're actually doing the exact same thing. The Talmud tells a great story where one of the Romans came to Rabbi Kiva and tells, tells him, tells him, listen, your God hates poor people. Because if you like poor people, he wouldn't make them poor. So Rabbi Kiva responds to him and saying, no, you have it all wrong. God loves us and enables us the opportunity to give to poor people. We think is that as well, there's inequality. God just, he's not equal. And we have to try to rectify God's misdeeds. No! God's given us an opportunity to recognize that everything that we have is from him. If we were blessed, who blessed us? God blessed us. And we have an opportunity to become like God and become givers. If everything was equal, there'd be no reason to give to become a giver. If you don't become a giver, you can't become like God. Because what, what does God do all the time? Gives us life, gives us prosperity, gives us health, gives us everything. Thus, charity is an opportunity for us to recognize our faith and to develop it internally. And Thomas says something very striking. Uh, this is uh, counterintuitive. More than what the rich man does for the poor man, the poor man does for the rich man. Who actually benefits? Everyone benefits. Uh, it's mutually beneficial, the transaction of the poor person receiving charity from the rich man. Everyone benefits. But who benefits more? The poor person, well, now he has he has lunch, right? The rich person, he has olam abba. He has eternal life because of doing a mitzvah. Who benefits more? For the rich man. When someone gives charity, they are recognizing that God really owns everything, and God's just giving us the ability to become great people and become like Hashem when we give charity. And of course, we don't actually lose, which is the amazing part of it. The more charity you give, the richer you become. And therefore, it's just an absolute slam dunk victory to give charity. And indeed, it is the culmination, or it's placed right in the middle of all the festivals, because someone who does that is someone who really takes the lesson to heart. The next festival is Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the, again, back to the theme of the spiritual stations. What's the, well, when was the first Rosh Hashanah? First Rosh Hashanah was the day that Adam was created, day six of creation. Day one was the 25th day of Elul. And day six was Rosh Hashanah, first day of Tishrei. And therefore, Rosh Hashanah is the birthday of man. Birthday is when man was transformed. Now man exists. If we want to transform ourselves, when is the greatest opportunity of renewal, reinvigoration, recalibration, to reframe who we are as people? It's the day that we were initially created. And that's the opportunity of the day. And additionally, Rosh Hashanah is called the Yom Adin, the Day of Judgment. Why is it the Day of Judgment? Well, what happened on that day? 
man was created. And what did man do? Man recognized God. So God's status, so to speak, as being a dominion, being a power, being a deity over someone that has the ability to choose to reject God. Well, that's an expansion of God's kingdom. There's independent, so to speak, verification where man who has the capacity to reject God still chooses to embrace God. Therefore, God's kingdom, so to speak, began on that day as well. Well, what happens every day on the anniversary of a kingdom? The kingdom gets renewed. When a kingdom gets renewed, what's the first thing the new administration does? Is they fire all the officials of the previous administration that don't contribute to the cause and to the thrust of the new administration. Every Rosh Hashanah, all the people of the world are evaluated. How much are they assets to the administration of God, so to speak, in the world? And how much are the liabilities? They're, they're all judged. And thus we see all the themes of Rosh Hashanah are intersecting in the actual event that kick started that spiritual station that we re- revisit. We learn about the Sukkis. Sukkis and Shemini Atzeris. We get a lot of details about the law, of course, uh, about, about the festival. Of course, it's the time where we sit in the Sukkah. We abandon our permanent home and we move into a little shack in the backyard for seven days. And the lesson of of that, of course, is that what's our life here? Even if someone lives for a thousand years, it's still a thousand years and then it's over. There's no way to evade the fact that our life here is temporary. But the Yetzirah says, no, it's permanent. And therefore you should prioritize it in your agenda. What we're reminding ourselves is, yes, this shack is temporary. It's a seven-day shack. But my opulent home is a different gradient of temporality. It's also temporary. It might not be seven days, it's 70 years. But it's still, what's the difference? Essentially, they're both temporary. And for six, seven days, we actually live in a temporary dwelling place to remind ourselves that our life over here is temporary and we should try to invest as much as we can in our soul, which is permanent. And in Olam Abba, which is permanent as well. And there's a mitzvah, of course, to take this four species, the Arba, meaning the Lulav and the Esrog. And we know that Sukkis comes right on the heels of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur we spoke about last week. Of course, we see it here as well. Uh, and that is when we the final judgment is given. And we know there's a pledge given to the Jewish people. The Jewish people will never be destroyed. Every generation people try to destroy us. And they might be successful uh, to destroy pockets of the Jewish people, but the Jewish people will never be destroyed. That's a pledge made many times to Abraham, elsewhere in the Torah. Therefore, after Yom Kippur, when judgment is finally sealed, what do we do? We came out victorious yet again. And we're like a warrior, returning from the battlefield, brandishing the sword of victory. That's what the lulav is. Lulav is this it's akin to a sword that we come and we're holding it high and we shake it in every direction showing, look, we went to war and we emerged victorious again. In verse 40, we see perhaps the hardest myths from the Torah. It tells us first the four different species that we take for, uh, uh, that we take on the holiday. And by the way, how is an esrog described? A pre eats hadar, a beautiful fruit tree. Which fruit tree? It's a citron, but the Torah doesn't say a citron. It says a beautiful fruit tree. There's a lot of beautiful fruit trees. Yet somehow, every single Jew and every single Jewish community agrees that the obscure citron tree is the tree that we're talking about. How that happened is a great mystery for those who don't believe in Torah Shabbat Pen, oral Torah. Uh, but regardless, the verse ends, you shall rejoice before Hashem your God for a seven-day period. The Gon of Vilna famously said that the hardest mitzvah the Torah to fulfill is the mitzvah you have to be joyous for seven days straight. Doesn't say, doesn't say to be joyous most of the time, to be joyous some of the time. Seven days of absolute ecstasy. Not an easy thing to do. Uh, how do you be joyous? The Talmud actually says, interesting, uh, the Talmud says, well, how do you be joyous? So it says it depends. For men, meat and wine. 
For women, clothing and jewelry. Chapter 24 gives us some more mitzvos. The mitzvah of the menorah, how to light it. Aaron should light it. It should light from the morning, morning to night. There's the mitzvah of the showbreads. If you remember, we talked about this, the table. The table has these breads in it. And here we, is where you get the description of the breads. It's there from uh, uh, two stacks of six bread, breads. It's put there on every Shabbos to the following Shabbos. And what's left over is given to the sons of Aaron to the Kohen. So wheat old bread is given to Aaron and his descendants. What was miraculous about this is, is that even though the, the bread was old, it never went stale. Okay, and the f- last episode of this Parsha is a story about a blasphemer, the Mechalel, or Megadev, as he's known as Hebrew. Now, there's an amazing backstory. Who is this guy? So it gives us the description. He's the son of a Jewish woman, but of an Egyptian man. And... He is a malcontent, and he gets into fights, and he decided to do something uh, unconscionable where he blasphemed. And they brought him before Moshe, and it does name his mother, who she is, gives us an eternal monument to her promiscuity. Her name was Shilomis, the daughter of Divri from the tribe of Dun. So w- what is his story? So Rashi gives us his backstory. If you remember, Moshe killed an Egyptian man who was fighting with a Jewish man. It's one of the first things that Moshe did. Se- I think it's the second thing that Moshe did as an adult in chapter 2 of Exodus. Why was this Egyptian man fighting with a Jewish man? The answer was is that this Egyptian man is the father of this blasphemer. And he committed adultery with that man's wife. And the child of that illicit relationship is this head case for the Jewish people. Problematic child. Now, Rashi also says that the reason why it calls out this woman by name it's actually to tell us the praise of the Jewish people. She was the only adulterous woman in the entire nation. So therefore, we're kind of naming her, and she's uh, put on a pedestal. She alone engaged in such behavior, and no one else. Why was this person, why was he a malcontent? Why did he get into a fight? So Rashi brings us two reasons. First, he... In juxtaposition to the previous statement, he had a problem. He's like, wait a minute. What King doesn't do that. King doesn't give weak, old, stale bread to his people. He gives fresh bread. Why is Hashem giving us, giving the Kohen the stale bread? That's one reason. Another reason is because he had a problem. No one wanted him. Remember, the Jews were broken down to 12 tribes. His father was an Egyptian. So he was, yes, Jewish a thousand percent. But he came to the tribe of Dun because his mother was from the tribe of Dun. And says, "Well, where's my, where's my, where's my role? Where's my seat at the table?" And I said, "I'm sorry, you don't have a seat at the table because your father was an Egyptian, and this this part goes through your father. Yes, you're Jewish. That comes from your mother, but not you don't have a portion in our tribe. So he was a kind of tribeless, and therefore he was a malcontent, and he just got very frustrated and he started cursing." Because so because he was he he was stateless, he was frustrated and he ended up doing the unthinkable. He cursed out, he blasphemed, and they executed him. And this is the first episode of the Jewish court actually um, engaging in capital punishment. As we know, the Torah does support capital punishment uh, under certain instances when there's witnesses and testimony, and everything. And the, Talmud, and, the, and the verse concludes uh, with some laws of the courts, namely the laws of murder, uh, the laws of theft, the laws of injury, injury to an animal, injury to a human. And this, uh, the verse concludes, Moses spoke to the Jewish people, 
They took the blasphemer out to the outside of the camp. They stoned him to death. And the children of Israel did as Hashem commanded Moshe. This is actually one of two episodes that we learn of people that were executed uh, that we know of because of their horrific misdeeds. Uh, Parshas Emor begins with the laws of the Kohen, the most holy, most pure. Uh, and it ends, unfortunately, with this tragic episode of a Jew that went awry. And in the middle, we have very detailed accountings of the uh, holidays and the festivals. Next week, prepare for some fireworks. It's a double parsha uh, with some very interesting twists and turns.